sectors. They are compelled to recalibrate, acquire new knowledges, become more skillful as they confront these adversities. They are activists, journalists, storytellers, poets, researchers, teachers, and much more as they accompany their communities. They embody the resilience and become the resource they need. MIA community workers have organized, uh, have mobilized counter storytelling as a tool for challenging majoritarian stories that dehumanize MIA people. Majoritarian stories rely on willful forgetting and distortions of colonial histories, contested borders and displacement that shape politics of belonging. Such narratives in turn establish epistemic parameters, for example, who gets to speak and on whose terms. As MIA scholar Shalim Hussain points out, quote, these narratives are very heavily weighed on one side because for the longest time, they have been the creators of discourse. What I mean is to even enter into a conversation with such groups, we have to concede to some of their myths. This is a very powerful reminder of the limits of the rhetorical practice of inclusion. In the absence of epistemic justice, inclusion is reduced to accommodation into profoundly unequal and violent structures. We have created the MIA Community Research Collective as a way to advance epistemic justice building an assemblage that honors MIA people's stories and brings those into the public arena to be acknowledged and witnessed. Centering radical relationality and communal knowing, our research collective seeks to denaturalize violence against MIA people. For example, we bring together MIA people's experiences and critical historical analysis to name the coloniality and state violence inherent in current citizenship practices. The state, however, is not a monolithic entity. By institutionalizing mistrust and legitimizing majoritarian stories, everyday citizens are deputized to regulate parameters of citizenship. Therefore, counter storytelling is as much about uplifting social, political, and cultural survival. Towards that end, we are building a, an intergenerational oral history archive that honors what Sherry Moraga calls theory in the flesh. Universities do not house our research collective, the community does. Research for us is an expression of what Maria Lugones has called communality, communal wanting, imagining, visioning, intending, and acting together. MIA community workers have also launched community media platforms such as Ango Kober and Mishang Stories. Unapologetically centering their people, they create digital stories at complex intersections of history, ecology, citizenship, and culture. Through these counter stories, they uphold their complex personhood, refusing to be coded within master narratives of deficit, disaster, or danger. For Mia people, their very identity is a site of struggle. And from this struggle has emerged Mia poetry, a powerful, resistant, and healing practice. Mia poetry is many things. It is an intimately experienced and lived political commitment. It is language justice that centers denigrated Mia dialects. It is a form of bearing witness, what Mia poet Shalim Hussain calls a roll call of the history of violence. What sets Mia poetry apart is the defined absence of a grammar and hierarchy. Mia poets assert that poetry belongs to the people and must not be policed. They refuse gatekeeping practices and resist domestication by establishment literary scholars, something that is defiantly captured in these lines from a poem by Shalim Hussain. Poetry will be daddy's cracked hands. Poetry will be turmeric caught in the cracks and the old key she used to scoop it out. Poetry will be mobile. Poetry will be Greece. Poetry will learn its okat. Markasam, poetry will belong. I hope that in these past few minutes, I have been able to offer a glimpse into the ways in which MIA communities are challenging oppression and structural violence, how they render visible their histories, labor, struggles, resilience, defiance, and desire their movement towards collective protagonism as they narrate and as they narrate situated and mobile meanings of Mia 
that transgress tiered categories of humanity. They perforate official archives and create new ones informed by a radically inclusive imaginary. For them, their everyday lives are sites of creative and ideologically critical practices speaking truth to power, always in defense of love and against anything that which is dehumanizing. As Mia poet Shiraj Khan writes, just as the tongues of beasts and birds have no books, my language has no school. I draw a tune from my mother's mouth and sing Bhatiali. I match rhythm with rhythm, pain with pain, clasp the sounds of the land close to my heart and speak the whispers of the sand. The language of earth is the same everywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ermi, for sharing with us all the humanity, affirmation, resistance, and resilience of Mia communities. Now I would like to introduce our second panelist and presenter, Dr. Monica Marianingrum. I will share a little bit about um, Dr. Marianingrum. She is a faculty member at Sanata Drama University in Indonesia where she is involved in a number of research projects and community service programs, particularly in the areas of community participatory action research and community empowerment. In collaboration with local disability organizations, she is currently developing a support group for families of children with multiple disabilities to cultivate empowering settings within organizations. And as we continue in the spirit of resistance and resilience and communities caring and affirming themselves, I would like to introduce Dr. Maria Ingram. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And um, also, I would like to thank uh, the conference committee for giving me this opportunity. It is really such an honor to be part of this panel. Thank you. Uh, terima kasih. Before I start, I would like to pay my deepest respect to the traditional owners of the land where this conference is organized and wherever you are joining us today. Uh, within the broader theme of creating inclusive and empowered culture and communities, I would like to share my reflection as a community psychologist engaging in disability studies and activism in the Indonesian context. Uh, there are a couple of uh, reflections that I would like to bring into this conversation. Uh, firstly, I would like to share what does it mean to create inclusive and empowered culture in relation to disability issues in Indonesia. Uh, what are the possibility and challenges? Um, and secondly, uh, I'm going to reflect on the meaning of solidarity in this context, particularly from uh, the vintage point of those working in university settings. In relation to disability issues in Indonesia, uh, creating inclusive cultures is about challenging the normalized discrimination and marginalization commonly imposed upon people with disabilities, which have deeply entrenched at various levels and domains, whether at personal or societal levels, and whether in social, cultural, economic, or political domains. For example, uh, in this pandemic context, uh, where living under lockdown has become our new normality, uh, for some of the people with disabilities with whom we're working with at the organization. They have been living in a lockdown for their whole life. 
So I couldn't agree more with Paola Bala, who shared a similar reflection regarding the life of indigenous women in Australia in the first webinar series of this conference. Just like what Paula said, I think this pandemic has surfaced the harsh realities that some groups in our society have been living with since long before the pandemic. Some of the causes and forms of discrimination and marginalization experienced by people with disabilities in Indonesia to have similarities to what people with disabilities in many parts of the world are still experiencing, such as uh, the remaining domination of medical uh, and pathologizing approaches to disabilities, which have perpetuated the views on and treatment to people with disabilities as the inferior others, or even perhaps as subhuman, as what Thomas Thiel mentioned in yesterday panel. However, there are also issues which appear to be more distinctive in relation to the historical, cultural, and political factors which are specific to the Indonesian context and the community we're working with. For example, through my previous studies and current involvement uh, in the disability organization, I learned that in the context of disability activism, promoting a sense of empowerment is not merely about advocating the notion of human rights and how everyone has the right to be treated with dignity and equality. While this kind of advocacy does have its significant roles in advancing the disability movements in Indonesia. However, in the organization we are working with, people profoundly associated their sense of empowerment with the idea of having opportunities to be a useful person for others, which reflects both their religious and cultural worldviews as Javanese people. In Javanese worldviews, people's sense of personhood is strongly defined by the extent to which people feel that they have brought goodness to others, especially in a rural context like where our organization is located. The Javanese ethics of social care continues to be a significant feature of people's community life as it is manifested in various forms of mutual exchanges and cooperation which define our sense of communality. However, people with disabilities are often alienated from such social cultural practices due to the stigmatizations that they experience. Therefore, being socially excluded in this context is not only about not having access for meaningful participations, but also about not having opportunities for people to fully experience their culturally contextual understanding of a meaningful existence. So with this example, I'm moving to my second point of reflection. What does solidarity mean in this context, especially in regard to the roles of psychological studies of disability? There are a couple of points that I would like to put forward in answering this question. Firstly, Solidarity means challenging the normalized, pathologizing and objectifying approaches to disability studies, which is still commonly found in Indonesian psychological research on disabilities. By approaching disability as mainly an individual problem, the holistic views of the life of people with disabilities, which are textured by their socio-cultural and historical context, tend to be ignored. Instead, what is being emphasized is the use of hegemonic knowledge, such as psychological notions of normalities versus abnormalities, which often position people with disability as a mere object of study and alienate them from their social ecology. Secondly, 
solidarity in this context is about promoting more emancipatory ethics, epistemologies, and methodologies in order to advancing more locally contextual knowledge and practices. For example, when initiating the organization, we spend a long period of time uh, for doing what in Indonesian is usually known as silaturahim or silaturahmi. So it is basically having regular time to visit the families with whom we're working with and just having a long chat without any preset agenda. It is through uh, this silaturahim process that we were trying to nurture more emancipatory relations. It may sound quite a simple gesture, but in the context where interventions to disability issues are usually in a form of external agencies or persons or local officials uh, approaching the related individuals or families with preset agendas and programs and even timetables, uh, this kind of more naturally evolving evolving ways of building the nation appear to have a profound meaning. So that's the reflection that I would like to bring into the conversation, Jessica. Uh, looking forward to the next panelists and terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica, for sharing with us the ways in which um, communities are engaging in their own cultural values to affirm themselves and create empowering settings that are grounded within their own cultural knowledge and experiences and rooted very much in this notion of emancipatory empowerment to affirm their humanities. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Nuria Siafolo. Dr. Siafolo is a core professor of the Community Liberation, Indigenous and Eco-Psychologies at the Pacifica Graduate Institute here in California. She has worked for more than 40 years with indigenous communities in Northern, Central and Southern Mexico, as well as Hawaii. Her scholarship spans indigenous psychologies that center indigenous cosmologies, epistemologies and healing praxis as well as participatory action research in partnership with communities. Her recent book, Indigenous Psychologies in an Era of Decolonization, was written in partnership with Maya Lacandon Youth and community leaders in the Lacandon Forest in Chiapas, Mexico. And with that, I warmly welcome Dr. Nuria Siafol. Sorry. Thank you very much. Jessica. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Before I start, I would like to uh, express my deepest honor for being with you here today and also uh, would like to uh, express my deepest gratitude for being among this amazing dissident woman uh, and acknowledge as well um, the Shumash right to the land that Pacifica Graduate Institute occupies, as well as to their uh, rights for all the contributions and legacies for which we benefit. Um, I will focus today on talking about the contributions that um, are usually silent coming from the Global South uh, in creating communities uh, with well being, resilience, and uh, contestation. Authors of the Global South have been deconstructing the deep impacts of colonization on the human psyche to propose pathways towards decoloniality. Such examples existed in the 19th and 20th century with W.E.B. Du Bois, Fanon, Memi, who 
talked about total consciousness, uh, internalized oppression, interjection of um, the aggressor, um, and uh, also possibilities for resistance and liberation. Walsh and Mignolo asserted that the colonial contributions appeared since centuries ago from thinkers, activists, and practitioners around the globe, and from the many others whose hair stories, trans stories, and our stories of thought have been made invisible from, uh, due to racism and heteropatriarchy of the modern colonial. Current discussions on coloniality have dismantled the still persisting forces and structures embedded in neoliberal capitalism that maintain and perpetuate social pathologies. We have, them, we have heard such discussions yesterday in the panel before us. This includes the system that produces, disseminate and archive its knowledge and practices, such as academia and its disciplines. Community psychology has been claimed creation of Europe and the United States, particularly the latter, as it can export it to other geopolitical localities as the universal and legitimized subdiscipline of Western psychology. Epistemologies of the Global South provide invaluable teachings of, for transformative revisions of community psychology with frameworks that go beyond liberation and toward decoloniality, co-creating alternatives to rather than of the status quo. Urmitura, for instance, urges us to interrogate the sources of community psychology's knowledge production and its impacts on conceptualization. In agreement with Randell Carolisen, she urges us to question the conceptualization of community as a disadvantaged other in need for intervention. Christopher Son demanded that community psychology addresses the imperative consequences of coloniality and the epistemic ignorance in non-Western knowledge and praxis systems. In collaboration with Maria Olga Reyes, they proposed a decolonial standpoint to dismantle white privilege and unequal power in racialized discursive practices and relations. And Joseph Cohn emphasized that theory needs to evolve from practice-based evidence that includes relations with nature and spirits. But likewise, Marisol de la Cadena shared that her Andean mentors and friends understood practice and knowledge that is inseparable from ethical and political obligations to humans and non-humans alike. And this is embedded in which in which she called wordling without consuming difference. In Abia Ayala, the original name of the American continent, praxis were and continue to be the main vehicle of social transformation to accomplish liberation from pervasive forms of colonial oppression. For instance, during the 60s and 70s, Latin America social scientists devoted their efforts to the analysis of inequities and the challenges posed by the uncritical adoption of ethnocentric social sciences developed in Europe and North America. Referring to Freire's problematization, Irma Serrano Garcia emphasized that it starts with ourselves. She urged us to question if our methods and practices are respectful of cultures and contribute to uh, res be respectful with communities and, and non-exploitative. And if these also contribute to self-determination, sovereignty and decolonization, or as Isaac Priletensky will say, to psychopolitical validity. Within Latin American Academy, committed praxis is conducted not only in communities that are struggling for survival, like Vincent will say, 
but also in the form of large student movements that ended in tragedy due to violence applied by repressive governments, such as the 1968 massacre of students in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas in Mexico City and the death of the 43 students in Ayosinapa Guerrero on September 26, 2014. Marisa Montero described how Latin American community psychologists evolved from popular education, participatory action research, consciousness raising based on Freudian liberation theology, constructivism, Marxism, and liberation psychology founded by Martin Baró. Eduardo Almeida added that community psychology in Mexico has been rather informal and created by indigenous community, communities since pre-colonial times. Furthermore, he asserted that US-centric community psychology has had weak influence in the development and applications of Mexican community psychology that has emerged from indigenous and peasants movements, critical education, participatory action research and quote, the rebelliousness of woman, end of quote. Dissident woman unite in the struggle against assumptions of progress and civilization that justify inequities and exploitation engendering human and ecological atrocities. The colonial feminists from the global south are co-constructing new ways of being with sentipensar, proposed by Arturo Escobar as feeling thinking with the earth and contest patriarchal rationality and universalism. Maria Eugenia Sanchez Diaz de Rivera conceived the coloniality as a living process that constructs the feminine in plurality and the non-capitalist society. Grondrona Opaso proposed that community psychology be based on indigenous cosmovisions of sumac cause, buen vivir, well-being, that include the rights of the earth. Indigenous women who promote holistic community well-being through the use of traditional healing practices and activism revive cultures and knowledge systems. Grassroots movements and organizations that embrace the nosotras, the we, the peoples, resist and survive corporate greed and ecological extractivism and provide examples from which we must learn to co-construct decolonial de community psychologies otherwise. Walsh further added that the Zapatista community struggles generate political pedagogies from below. She proposed that the Global South becomes a new political imaginary to co-create the coloniality. Isabel Stengers described an ecology of practices based on relational heterogeneity with differences, but not divisions, that reclaim animism to relate with the earth beings and expand connections with other worlds. When we insert our community praxis in an ecology of knowledges, it is not about reaching consensus of one common understanding, but rather being competent to understand the ontological difference that these worldlings entail as they emerge from a plurality of cosmovisions against a one world world anchored in the Anthropocene. Committing to work with indigenous communities, co-creating praxis-based knowledges for liberation means making the colonial community psychology otherwise. I have described examples of these co-creating knowledges and praxis in a previous webinar within this conference. In addition, a group of youths from the Lacandon Rainforest of Chiapas, with whom I have been working for over a decade, presented a panel in this conference entitled Majan Psychologies in an Era of Decolonization, in which they shared their cosmologies, axiologies, praxiologies, and ecological spirituality in their commitment to preserve 
the rich biodiversity of their beloved rainforest. As concluding note, this conference has been a clear testimony of pluriversal community psychologies arising in diverse locations, reflecting varied cosmovisions and ecologies of praxis that make the road otherwise. Thank you very much for this beautiful opportunity to learn from all of you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Nuria, for sharing with us your, your vision, the collective uh, vision that you have been witnessing with the Lacandon communities, the Maya communities, and also for taking us through this powerful reflexive uh, overview of epistemologies of decolonization this the abajo, desde el buen vivir from the global south. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Michelle Fine. Dr. Michelle Fine is a distinguished professor at the Graduate Center at City University of New York. She has authored numerous books and articles on youth, education, and adolescent sexuality, and is a pioneer in the field of youth participatory action research, specifically critical participatory action research. She is also a founding faculty member of the Public Science Project, where she has been involved with a series of participatory studies with youth and elders and communities, with youth and elders who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated college students, and youth working at the intersections of movements for education, immigration, and juvenile justice. And with that, we give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Am I unmuted? We I am you. here. I am here. Uh, thank you. It's so beautiful that um, to be on this panel. It, it's as though we all got together last night and had drinks and decided um, to focus on some shared commitments, even though, in fact, we didn't get together last night. So let me thank um, Chris and Rachel and Emma and Jessica for holding space for all of us. Let me acknowledge that I, um, I live on the lands of the Lene Lenape, um, and let me acknowledge the violence that my country has produced globally through global racial capitalism, through carceral logics, through immigration, through our deeply racist and classist and ignorant relation to the COVID crisis. Um, through environmental injustice and, um, and the ravages of an expanded uh, global capitalist set of commitments that extract knowledge and, um, and monies and peoples and dignity. Um, we're working on it, but as a nation, we have lots to, um, to be ashamed of and enraged by. I, um, I don't have a PowerPoint. I have hands. That's what I use. Um, I love listening to uh, Ermi, Monica, and Nuria. Um, I will share um, my perspective on what it means to be engaged in uh, critical solidarity studies. And for us, that is through critical participatory action research. As a white woman in the global north at a university, I feel like I have an obligation to speak particularly to the obligations of universities to expose structural violence, to align ourselves and dedicate our resources to the struggles of social movements for social justice. Um, and for those of us within psychology, to challenge what has been called the epistemology of ignorance or the ways in which the privilege of psychology has framed social issues as individual problems, has victim blamed and has failed to interrogate the unjust accumulation of privilege that wealthy people, white people, able-bodied people, global north, um, residents um, occupy. So I'm going to take you into uh, the public science project, which is where I do most of the work that I do. I'll talk about some of our commitments. And Jessica, 
stop me if I run over, but I'll try to give you a piece of a project we're currently working on. Um, at the Public uh, Science Project at the Graduate Center, we are a research collective of activists, academics, um, young people, incarcerated folks who come together to generate research in alignment with social movements for the collective good. For us, critical participatory action research is an epistemology, it is not a methodology. It's a way of recognizing that expertise is widely distributed, even though legitimacy is not, which resonates very much to, I think, the work that Monica was, was narrating. We are, we are fortunate that um, at this point, many social movements are asking for our participation and solidarity to bring humbly the um, resources of critical research to the movements that they're pursuing, whether that's queer youth in the United States or the struggle to remove police from schools or um, the struggles of family separation and children caged at the border, or most currently working with domestic violence survivors inside prison. So we create research collectives where we share our distinct forms of expertise, drawing on Sandra Harding's notion of strong objectivity, and together we research social issues to generate evidence that can be used in campaigns for justice and policy change in performance in popular education and in social theory. There are seven critical elements that I just wanna name really quickly and then I'll give you a brief look at a project. Um, our most fundamental commitment is, and again, many of you have referenced this, epistemic justice, that is the recognition um, that the people who have been most impacted by injustice have the right, and as academics, we have the responsibility to honor that, that they should center the inquiries that we engage. Um, so we draw from Arjun Apadurai, who speaks about the right to research, but we also draw from Ignacio Martin Barro, who believes very much in research by and for the people. We, the second commitment is that we refuse downstream analyses. So much of psychology looks at the bottom of the river to find out, oh my God, what's wrong with those groups? Um, and then sometimes we say, oh goodness, they're also so resilient. But rarely do we look upstream at the structures, the policies, the inequities, the racial capitalism, the white supremacy, the carceral logic, the misogyny that creates the flow. Um, and there we really draw from W.E.B. Du Bois, who taught us in the volume, The Philadelphia Negro, um, how dare we look in impacted communities for the source of the problem. We can establish solidarities with impacted communities in struggle, but it is our obligation to look upstream and look at what are the structures that cause this? What are the policies that cause this? Who's making money? Who's being privileged? And who's benefiting from current arrangements? And again, as a white North American, I feel an obligation to name unjust privilege, not simply, though it's no small task to work in solidarity with communities under siege, the third commitment is that we, um, again, we draw from Ignacio Martin Barro, that our work um, seeks to challenge dominant lies. We do, we do a lot of work with um, folks in prison, challenging the stories that are being told about racialized incarceration in our country. The fourth is that we create research collectives organized around what Gloria Anzaldua would call nos otras, right? So she took the word nos otras, us, and she separated it into nos, us, otras, others. And we build research collectives that are primarily impacted people and other folks who might have something to contribute to the research. 
and again drawing from Anne Zaldua, who um, in her, in her um, beautiful life and after her death, I have turned her into a critical psychologist. So I think she has taught us a lot that we can learn. Um, she also talked about the importance of chokes, clashes, moments when in our research collectives, if we're working across power lines, if we're valuing differences, that we're gonna come into clashes. Those are growth moments. Those are not reasons for us to back off. Those are not, they should no longer be surprises. Um, the fifth or sixth or whatever number I'm on is that our work is dedicated to action. It can be action as in um, protest, it can be action as in policy, it can be action as in performance. I should remind you all, maybe you all know this, W.E.B. Du Bois had a whole pageantry genre to perform, as did Orlando Falls Borda, as did many community researchers who understood that they were accountable to the communities from which they came and that their primary um, research products should be expressed in ways that were accessible to communities, not just speaking up to policy. And finally, I just want to um, bring uh, the ghost of Maxine Green, one of my mentors. Um, she was an old lady, amazing philosopher, then she passed away. Maxine Green um, was a philosopher who argued that our work should provoke aesthetic awakenings, not anesthetic numbings. That, that, and, and I think all the work on the panel that you've heard so far is designed to be intellectually, theoretically, ethically, and aesthetically provocative so that we might imagine how things could be otherwise. Do I have two minutes, Jessica, or no? You have more than two minutes, Michelle. Oh. You have about three or four minutes. So oh my your goodness. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I wanna go into one project that we're involved in right now. And I just got off the, the Zoom call. Um, last year, 2019, I know it feels like a century ago. In 2019 in New York state, a law was passed called the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act. And it was uh, long fought for by survivors of domestic violence who have been criminalized for their survival strategies. So these are women in prison who had experienced domestic violence. Other than racism and classism, domestic violence is probably the most direct route for women to enter prison. So this law requires that if a woman or a man can demonstrate that they were experiencing intimate violence when they committed their crime, that they can potentially have their sentence um, reheard and their, their sentence reconfigured by a judge. It's an amazing law passed by amazing activists who themselves were what were called criminalized survivors but it's only an amazing radical law if the women inside know about it and can reimagine their stories in this history. Um, we put together a research group of nine formerly incarcerated women, a lawyer, Maria Elena Torre, who's the director of the Public Science Project and myself. We've put together a database of the 487 women in New York State who would be eligible to um, petition for resentencing. Now, most of the women on our advisory board know those women. They also know how domestic violence lives in the bodies of women in prison. They also know that the women who have most experienced domestic violence are on the mental health ward. They also know that the space between a woman in prison and her feeling entitled to fight for justice, that that journey is littered with shame, guilt, responsibility, depression, pain, embarrassment. And yet thousands of men in New York State are applying under this law to be resentenced because they experienced violence in their lives. And for men, it seems, or some men, and we, we're including trans women as well here, it looks like the path from I've been criminalized to I'm entitled to justice looks less cluttered 
with the gendered baggage, particularly um, for women of color who are in prison and don't always have the evidence that is needed to demonstrate that they were experiencing domestic violence because they didn't call the cops. Because I've, as you have seen all summer, the cops could shoot them. The cops could take their children away. So the white women that we're working with, they're not privileged women, but they're more likely to have the very evidence that is needed even for this radical law. And recently, and I'll end with this, recently the first person to get out under DVSJA was announced by our lawyer on our Zoom call. And she said, I'm excited to tell you that the first person to get out on DVSJA is now out and his name is, and she said his name. And the women on the screen all looked curious, if not angry. And, and Sharon White, one of our colleagues said, I mean him no harm, but we did not pass this law. When is it our turn for women of color? We did not pass this law primarily for white women and men of color to get out of prison. When do we get our shot? So that's, that's what we're working with a group of women inside, building a curriculum for how to help women kind of grow a new narrative. Um, in COVID, it's very hard to do work with folks locked up. As, as uh, wonderful as Governor Cuomo might have sounded to some of you around quote, COVID, he hasn't let anybody out of prison. And so we are calling women, um, telling them that we're advocating for them and the tears of solidarity across bars between this kind of critical par project and the lives of women inside is um, a big piece of what's kept a lot of us going during the pandemic. Done, thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing with us uh, the, the powerful stories of, of hope, resilience, resistance, and, and refusal to remain silent under the carceral system um, that is ex exists in this country and in so many others as well. And that really brings to, to life the intersectional realities and experiences of these women who are, who are fighting to, to exist, to be, and to, to thrive, to be recognized and seen in full. Now I would like to have us all come together into a conversation and a dialogue of some of the reflections and responses that all of us have had with regards to the powerful and affirming presentations that our panelists have shared with us. And I would like to invite those in attendance, those who are participating in this webinar to please share your questions via the Q&A function on this webinar. And as you gather your thoughts and your reflections together, I would like to offer my reflections and then open it up for questions from attendees who would like to be a part of this dialogue as well. Some of the things that have surfaced for me in listening to the various projects and experiences that you've all engaged in as part of your research, but also as part of witnessing and accompanying these communities in resistance, in, in affirming what Fanon described as reciprocal recognitions that are affirming and humanizing, mm -hmm. um, is the question of how, in what ways has research or has the work or the praxis that you've engaged with communities, in what ways has that opened up opportunities and apertures for imagination, for healing, and for transformation. What are the possibilities and what have been some of the challenges that you've encountered? And I know that uh, Ermi and Michelle and Nuria and Monica described some of these challenges. And I'm wondering what are also the possibilities and radical imaginations that Aurora Levins Morales describes are happening and are creating these cracks within these systems? I know that was a very long winded question, but I wonder if you could just share some of your reflections on, on the possibilities, challenges, but also the healing, the transformation, and the uh, re reciprocal recognitions that you're witnessing in the work that you do. I 
I, I'm happy to dive in unless someone else wants to go. Is that all right? Hey, Michelle. Yes, thank you. Is that okay? Um, uh, again, th this project is um, uh, uh, lives in my heart and, uh, and all of it. Um, do, uh, on healing and transformation, there was one very difficult evening. So when this man, when we learned of this man, we had to have an, a, like a racial reckoning among us. We are a multiracial group. Um, and one of the white women said, uh, so Sharon White said, you know, I, I didn't do this so white women. And, and then one of the white women said, you know, I think I got out maybe because she's a very famous political prisoner, maybe because I was white. And then somebody else said, white and wealthy. Um, and, and then it got tight. We were back in our, in our racial corners, um, as this happened often, always, but these days. Um, and I was texting with Maria saying, how can we, how do we hold the we? And I'm channeling Gloria Anzaldua and, uh, um, and Sharon White, again, who's the voice for critical race theory among us says, I I'm just sorry. I you have no idea what it's like. If you're a black woman, you could not call the police. If you're a black woman, you could not tell your church. You could not tell your mother. A and, and then a white woman tried to say, I understand, big mistake. And then Cheryl Wilkins, another woman said, wait, we were all locked up together. Wait, we're all sisters. And there are those moments in this work, and I suspect in all the work that has been narrated tonight, where the, the difficult moments erupt and they need to, and then there's enough trust and solidarity and what it means to be bearing witness, but also accompanying and speaking back in multiple dialects. Um, that, that sutures this work. Some of these women I've been working with for 30 years because we worked together when they were incarcerated. There are a million challenges. I'm happy to talk about that, but I want my sisters on the panel to speak. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Jessica. And also, there are a couple other questions already at the chat box. Uh, I'd like to uh, go next. Other, uh, if Nuria or Umi would like to. Uh, may I? Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, please. please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Jessica. And... Um, I'm afraid my reflection would be more on the challenging side of it, something that I think we need to work on to be able to see the possibilities that we envision. Uh, I think our conversation highlights the operation of exclusion, uh, either in its subtle or overt forms, as a kind of weapon for the privilege to sustain the hierarchy uh, which, without which that privilege would be questioned. Uh, so with that uh, understanding, while I couldn't agree more with what Michelle mentioned about the importance of looking upstream uh, to the overarching system that create these excluding contexts. I also feel uh, the urging needs for us to be always vigilant uh, with how exclusions are actually operated in everyday acts. Um, and I like to, br to bring a brief, uh, a br a brief example uh, with that point. Um, the Indonesian government has ratified the International Conventions of the Rights of People with Disabilities since 2011. And since then, uh, there have been some remarkable achievements that mark the Indonesian disability movement, uh, such as the 
the emergence of disability acts and legislations uh, at the local levels um, and the flourishing developments of disability research centers. Um, and of course, all the credits go to all those brave and inspiring pioneers of disability activism in Indonesia. However, uh, there are still many, uh, and, it, and it was a long way, a long way to, uh, to achieve that point. Um, hello there. Uh, however, uh, there are still many struggles that we have to deal with at the everyday levels. Uh, for example, in our work with the organization, um, a heartbreaking situation that we still encounter now and then is meeting these persons who being confined in their room for their whole life by their family because of their, their disability. So it is such an experience that makes me think about the importance of being vigilant with how exclusion is manifested, reproduced, and maintained at everyday levels. And also to think about uh, the importance of being aware with the gap between the changes that happen at the structural levels with how those changes are actually translated into everyday acts. So that's a bit my reflection, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica, by offering your own experiences and threading it together with Michelle's experiences as well, and also uh, inviting us to remain vigilant at the same time that we maintain this sort of radical hope for the possibilities that can be actualized at the multiple levels of these systems, down into the ways in which communities can fully experience the, 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 the systemic change that oftentimes doesn't get manifested at the, at the reality, at the lived experience. Um, Nuria, Ermi, would you like yes. to offer some reflection? It's okay, Ermi. Uh, I go, I mean, I got, I think uh, I just wanted to add to what Monica just said, and, and you mentioned right now, Jessica, the intersectionalities, you know, the exponential uh, impacts of things uh, in communities with which we work. Um, so I think uh, huge challenges, for instance, I just also want to talk from experience um, now that uh, I have been so excited and, and the Black and Don youth were also very excited to be in this conference and have an audience. Uh, but one thing is like that is missing mostly in conferences, you know, that communities are there to teach us and we go to their presentations instead of we continuing to represent them and, uh, you know, with words of, uh, transformation and decolonization, but not really walking the road in giving them uh, the space to to teach us and that we learn from 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 them in in these academic conferences that become more of a guild uh, and rarely see their voices, you know, and their presence. Um, that's one thing. And in terms also adding to it, uh, I was very excited that. Uh, the only Majan Lakandon uh, teacher who spoke their language in a very small community um, passed away due to COVID, for instance, you know, and so the, uh, the uh, exposure to, to, to a pandemic, as, as we all know, um, that is uh, amplified through the intersectionality inequities that still exist, um, have such deep impacts, you know, because it's not just that they have lost some of their beloved, uh, uh, you know, families and friends and uh, community people, but also the intersectionality outcome of the, uh, the very deep threat of the loss of their education in the Majan language. And he was going to present here, um, uh, giving a lot of emphasis on that, for instance, that it is uh, very important to keep uh, transmitting culture and, uh, and giving that kind of education. So the challenge is the, uh, for instance, powerful uh, 
impact on education that is managed by um, by stand standardized practices in Mexico with uh, the intent to to, to nationalize, you know, to modernize and uh, for progress and civilization and uh, following the march that is dictated in the US, for instance, uh, that used to be that uh, no child left behind law also. But at the same time, uh, many, many uh, teachers across Mexico and mostly in, in Oaxaca and Chiapas uh, stand up to contest this uh, continuous continued colonial uh, intentions uh, through the powerful tentacles of, of hegemonic education. Uh, so that's a huge challenge, you know, to uh, try to create uh, and, and promote and ask for solidarity and funds uh, for them to, uh, to create a school that is based on their own language, uh, because that doesn't happen. Uh, the, the Mexican government even apparently uh, tries to uh, send teachers who speak a different indigenous language to other communities so that they end up communicating in Spanish. I mean, just to give an example of these uh, huge, deep, very sad challenges, but at the same time, the joy and excitement to see all these amazing teachers standing up. Many of them were indigenous teachers who were also fighting to preserve their languages and, and fighting, you know, like the Zapatistas also creating their own schools and, and health systems and very different transformative practices in communities uh, from which we must learn. The challenge is to bring them to these kinds of events so that they speak and we learn from them, not we represent them once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nuria, for uh, really affirming the centrality and the importance of creating and cultivating and holding space for communities to speak for themselves, not for us to become the, the ventriloquists or the, the, the speakers for them, but to really create these spaces where they can be heard in their own right um, and really challenging, not just as academics or the discipline, but challenging the institutionalization of, of knowledge and the ways in which knowledge circulates and gets reproduced when it's not the communities who are speaking um, for themselves and among themselves. Um, Ermi, would you like to share your thoughts? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for, uh, thank you, Michelle and Nuria and um, Monica for all of your very um, you know, thoughtful um, reflections on this question. Um, I have a few thoughts that I'll um, I'll add, and and I'm also sort of looking at some of the questions that have come up. So I'll try to um, thread um, some of those as well. Um, you know, what, what you, the question that you raised, um, Jessica, about um, healing and transformation. Um, I think the you know the moment we think about healing in these contexts, it has to be healing justice of when exploitation and oppression and violence and persecution are active and happening right now. You know, there isn't any ultimate justice, you know, that all of that has to stop and then the work of healing and repair has to begin. But so, so, so the challenge is really how do we, you know, what are the ways to heal and repair to the extent that it's possible um, as these things are, are happening. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, from, from our experience um, in the, um, within the MIA communities, MIA poetry has played a really key role in that. Um, there's also, you know, in addition to poetry, there's also um, music. Um, that's that's part of it, and, and a lot of it is reviving music, which have, you know, the, um, they're they're ancestral, you know, music that is, you know, that are not considered, um, you know, that that are usually considered um, lower in the hierarchy of anything that should be, you know, that that, that meets um, meets the mark for anything that's that's aesthetic, that's you know, that uh, constitutes art and culture. You know, so, so these are really important, but but also the reason why poetry is so healing is because it's really it's coming from the people. So these aren't so you know at the you know when I meant that they when I said that they said that uh, poetry should not be policed that it should belong to the people, they literally mean that. So anyone who is from the Mia community and writes a poem expressing their experience 
whatever aspect of experience um, you know that is that is mere poetry so it's it's sort of it's really opening up those kinds of spaces but it's also become a really powerful way for them to um, articulate what they feel um, so it's it's really being able to speak back to the kind of persecution and um, and violence that they have experienced, um, but also to be able to uh, document uh, the things that have happened, which are silenced by official narratives and discourses. So all of those things make it really powerful, and those are again they they create those spaces for healing, you know, for for connecting, um, and most importantly for younger people who have basically grown up with no you know th th there is no visible um, aspect of their culture or history that is viewed as empowering or that is even present so for then uh, you know within the, in that context mia poetry becomes really powerful um the other reason why it also becomes a space for healing is because the word mia which means um gentleman in urdu in the context of assam um that's considered a slur so that's how it's used. It's the most pernicious form of the other. Um, so given that context, you know, when they reclaim Mia, that has a lot of um, emotional and political and cultural power. Um, and what's been really interesting is that you know, you've seen, a, you know, you've sort of seen a snapshot of all of the different things that that's happening at the level of community. Um, and obviously, there are a lot of challenges. They get a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of um, pushbacks. But it's Mia poetry is one of the things which they have gotten the most um, pushback from, and in, from both state and non-state actors. So we are beginning to see how epistemic justice is not simply, you know, it's it's not something that's just about producing knowledge, but that claiming of that voice and of that and of carving out that intellectual and cultural and political space is what uh, you know we can clearly see how much of a reaction that's causing. Um, and that sort of, uh, you know, brings me to some of the other themes that came up in terms of, you know, relationality, questions of representation, and I'll just share a very, uh, you know, a, a quick example of what that has looked like. Um, I think, you know, these conversations are also very difficult because at the starting point of those conversations is often the global north, um, and the assumption that um, you have the, the academic, the person who's affiliated with the university and the community that's out there. And for for people who is you know whose whose identities are very you know are blurred, you know, and whose who's have shared histories, and for whom being in the academia is not about simply producing knowledge, but you know, but it can be a very political and personal act in terms of what it means to find a voice to be able to produce knowledge. So so I think I want to name that that that's something that a lot of our conversations get you know that that's always tacit. You know, we don't talk about it, but the assumption is that the community is always out there. Um, so, so sort of really, you know, what, what does the kind of radical relationality look like in different spaces um, where those kinds of um, boundaries are blurred? Um, and then the example that I wanted to share was, uh, you know, about sharing risks. That it's not only about opening up spaces, you know, as we work together, you know, what accompaniment and solidarity mean, but it's but but it's also about sharing risks, um, and uh, you know the some of the folks that you saw in the in the slides that I shared, uh, they the kind of hate and violence that and the kind of the ways in which they're also persecuted by by the state, but also by you know left leaning progressive liberal intellectuals who often use liberal discourse to undermine their movements. You know try to police uh, the you know their poetry and so on. Um, you know over the summer we had a, a panel. Which was on, uh, you know, we we had it was centering community Mia community workers, so they reflected on some of their experiences and related stories in their community about how people were being impacted. So we had a session around that, and when the information about that session got out, it just released this uh, the really really horrible hate speech. There were just unbelievable and incredible threats against them. Um, particularly against the women, um, and this wasn't something that had happened for the first time. You know, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that it has a different impact. But what was different this time was that my name was also there in the on the on the poster as someone who was moderating and interpreting. So at this time, so the the hate was also directed at me, and obviously I was here in the U.S., so you know it has very different implications. 
but you know something that came up in our in our conversations was this sort of connection that they felt that you know in some ways i had a more of an experiential understanding of what of what they were up against you know so so even as we were doing this work like that felt you know just experiencing that was important and sharing that risk was um, was important so so i think even in terms of you know, for for the kinds of you know for for possibilities and for healing, it means that we are able to, you know, that we are able to share some of those those risks. Um, and I think you know I'll, I'll end it with sort of uh, sort of raising a question around um, transnational solidarity. You know, that is something that you know that 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 all of us are connected to in some form or the other, um, and to be thinking about even what that looks like and also what that means to be in solidarity with. Uh, with with communities, with uh, you know, with with colleagues, with friends who are, you know, who are facing different kinds of risks and um, and threats across the world. So I'll um, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ermi, um, for for sharing those reflections and the very real risks that are implicated in the kind of work that you do and in the kind of work that many of us do, who are connected and very much situated in communities that are our communities and, and with, which, with whom we have these ties where the community is not the community but it's our community a community of which we belong to as well um, and i also valued the the underscoring of the importance of sharing risks right if we are willing to 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 share these institutional resources and as michelle constantly urges us to pool and leverage these institutional resources to support community struggles. We should also share the risks that accompany these radical transformations and cracks within the systems that we are trying to dismantle and imagine and create anew. Um, and also the importance of solidarity, which you all spoke to, but not just a solidarity in word, but a solidarity in action, a solidarity that comes with being an accomplice and really embracing the risks that come with that. I wanna now turn to a couple of the questions that some of our attendees have, have posed. Um, I'm going to try to combine some of these questions if, if, I, if, I, if I may, <laughs> so that they can open up for greater dialogue. One of the questions um, by Peter is, is directed at Michelle, but I wanna open up to all of our panelists. And the question is, if we could elaborate or say a little bit more about the importance of provoking aesthetic awakenings. And in listening to our panelists today, I, I believe that all of you in your work have ways and modalities by which you provoke these aesthetic awakenings. And I, I'll allow Michelle to elaborate on a definition and explanation of what that means, but you all use various ways of humanizing and bringing to, to life and reality the experiences and struggles of these communities, whether that be through through art, through poetry, through campaigns, organizing, activism, through being connected to, to land, culture, stories, different cosmologies, indigenous epistemologies. And so I'm wondering in what ways uh, have you engaged in the provocation of these aesthetic awakenings that really call us to to engage in that transformational justice that some of our attendees have have asked about and would like to to know more about in terms of how does this actually manifest in relation to your work so i borrow from maxine green maxine green also worked with john dewey and they both work to distinguish what they called um, aesthetic experiences that provoke a sense of rage, a sense of wonder, a, a new awakening, and anesthetic experiences. I think a lot of psychology is an anesthetic experience. It, 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 it calms, it, it narrates, it normalizes, it reduces, and it keeps us from experiencing injustice. I think each of the papers here was an anesthetic, was an aesthetic provocation visually um, in terms of the language people used in terms of the imagery, in terms of the ideas, the kind of 
intimate betrayals that Monica suggested, the cosmologies that Nuria suggested, Irma's just recent, what you just said about risk and vulnerability. Um, so uh, we have taken this notion of provocation as, as a goal. And I sometimes um, talk about our, our, our work should have provocative generalizability, not generalizability like statistical, but people should hear the work that you gave us about the um, communities you're each working with. And I should be able to say, wow, that really resonates to what I'm thinking about, about women in prison. Not like 22% of, of the children in Zapatista schools. Look, that's not what I mean, but, but that it echoes, it provokes something in me about moving. When Monica talked about the intimacy of, of betrayal. Um, and I just wanna say from Unami's, um, from one of the poems, um, I think it was, mother, why do you expel me, hate me? What was the exact language? Do you remember? Sorry. While you're looking, yeah. I thought that could be the title of our panel. Like for each of us, whether mother was country or, or the intimacy of a family where someone has a disability or a nation that incarcerates people of color, that I, I just, it's, so it's, that's what aesthetic awakening is. What was the exact line? I'm sorry. And I believe that really speaks to the importance of these reciprocal recognitions. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I'm tired, tired of introducing myself to you. I bear all your insults and still shout, mother, I'm yours. Uh, mother, I'm yours. Yeah, yeah. So I thank you for that aesthetic awakening. Thank you. And in, in, in the ethos of this, humanizing spiritual radical healing awakening of, of the aesthetic provocations that you've shared Michelle I will pose one other question because I'm being mindful of the time and seeing that we're almost almost out of time um, but one of the questions that I I think will would be a good question for us to, to end with and I'm, I invite you to respond to either the previous question or this question or both is what do you see in each other's work that inspires you and that you see parallels and connections. I know we've talked about some of these connections, but what are what are some some what are sources of affirmation, uh, inspiration, and human radical hope in these times that is so direly needed? <laughs> are you are you witnessing and carrying with you uh, from our time together? I'm certainly honored to be holding a lot and, and taking a lot with myself. Um, for the opportunity to connect and to learn from all of you. Well, likewise, I mean, I think that it has been a beautiful tapestry and I'm very excited with all the learnings that were shared here that, you know, again, uh, we could build those networks with the communities were working with as well to um, and and fund them together, you know, to also uh, catalyze um, these these learnings in praxis. And I will be so thrilled to get to know the woman Michelle is working with in the prison and get to hear their voices of what they're learning and creating and share it with others who are in other countries, prisons, and, uh, you know, Umi's, Umi's work with, with the indigenous community is deeply inspiring to, uh, and I have seen the power of uh, other communities who are in very 
similar struggles around the world, how amazing uh, and ignite our hope, like you call radical hope and aesthetic awakening can produce. Uh, also Monica's sharing of the uh, disability contestations, you know, against the ableist world that we are creating that we barely get to mention and uh, that can create again this powerful networks of solidarity and transformation. Thank you. I feel very, very grateful for what you gifted me today with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just, I, I too feel very honored and deeply grateful for, for the conversations and everything that, um, you know, all of you brought to the space. Um, I think something that that really uh, you know struck me and is going to stay with me is what um, Monica you brought up about social care, and there is something about you know about how that impacts you know, both marginalization but also the ways in which you are trying to you know make some of these these inroads, um, and it's such an important reminder for me that you know to or for all of us in fact to you know the importance of centering that social care. Um, and that it's it's not sort of, you know, it's it's not it's not trivial, but you know that that's something to be uh, that that we need to be taking in all of what we do, in in our relationships, you know, in in our in the different spaces that we are a part of, and certainly um, in in challenging um, oppression. Um, so so it's, that was something really powerful that I'm going to um, take from there. Um, and Nuria, I just, I was just so amazed with the ways that you threaded through all of these, you know, the different cosmologies, uh, you know, um, ecology, uh, ecologies that you were sharing. Um, and again, that was again, such a powerful reminder that we need to be, you know, how, why, you know, being pluriversal is so important. That all of these alternatives to the status quo that we are creating, and to not sort of fall into the trap of again hierarchically ordering different ways of being. Um, so, so thanks so much for that uh, reminder. Um, and and Michelle, I think you again reminded us about the importance about of politics of evidence, and the ways in which we can, uh, you know, and and the importance of using our institutional spaces and and challenging and pushing and you know and and creating. Uh, you know, these kinds of these perforations, if you will, in these institutional spaces to be able to uh, move forward our um, anti-oppressive and liberatory work. Um, so uh, thank you. And I, I really appreciate all of you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to have this such uplift uplifting connections and conversations, everyone. Um, I think I would like to relate my comments um, with a question about how to challenge psychology powers and privilege in relation to the excluding practices that we're witnessing in our, uh, in our society. Uh, I think coming from a country where the dominant phase of psychology is um, psychology which tends to be uh, individualizing issues uh, and socio-politically disconnected. For me, our conversations uh, underlined the importance of looking into everyday experiences of exclusion as a kind of embodied manifestations of how we might have either consciously or unconsciously internalized the oppressive system and context in which we live in. Uh, that we ourselves, may not be free from it, despite all the good intentions that we have. So that, uh, so in that sense, working toward inclusive and empowered culture does need our ability uh, to look at the intertwined between the everyday struggles that we encounter with the hegemonic powers uh, that want to maintain such struggles to secure their, uh, their sustenance. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. And now I'm, I'm being very mindful of the time. We've gone over a few minutes, but I think, what is time these days? 
<laughs> I, am, I am incredibly grateful to, to all of you for sharing with us your, your work, your scholarship, your reflections, the radical possibilities that our discipline and academia uh, could, could be, but yet doesn't do. And so here we are resisting, rising and existing, coexisting with each other, among each other and with our communities. In, in envisioning something other, a, a, a discipline that could be much more humanizing and transformative and grounded in, in what it needs to be or could be. And when that's not possible, um, we continue to pull from it to affirm the communities that are in struggle that, that we are a part of as well and we cannot turn away from. And so with that, I, I want to express my, my gratitude to you all for participating, for being present, for being here. And I will end our panel for today and wish you all a wonderful day, a wonderful morning, evening, wherever you might be located. Thank you so much for allowing me to be the chair and the, and the facilitator for our space. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everybody. Be safe.